Hello. Um, I, hi there. Uh, I'm Chris Graving, and uh, I'm going to be giving you all a workshop today on uh, making uh, like uh, data storytelling with using Hubble GL. So um, it'll be, this workshop will be kind of half conceptual, half practical. So there, there's, uh, at, the, at the end, I have some QR codes you can like point your phones at or your camera or your computers that I get, I didn't really think about that. You have, I have a link on there where you can go to like some JS fiddles and follow along or you know, we can send these slides out later and you can follow along. But um, uh, so I, uh, I work within DeckGL and specifically on the Hubble GL library, which is a, a library that you can use to tell stories with your data. Um, so once you build a visualization and you've got all the amazing data in there, it's designed, it looks great. Um, you run in often you run into situations where you're trying to now explain how like what is so great about this visualization you made you're trying to maybe do a presentation on it to an audience and um, in those situations it's really nice to be able to render out very high quality like no dropped frame versions of your visualizations and animate those to follow a narrative that you might be talking to, um, but where you don't need things like interactivity or like real time interaction or, or anything because you're up on stage and you're talking to someone or you're making a YouTube video and you want some maps in your video. So Hubble GL is a library that you can use uh, within the VizGL ecosystem to capture a canvas um, and do this non real time rendering. It's for those situations where you want to really bump the resolution up, you want to put a ton of data into the map that would actually like not be possible to deliver at 60 frames per second, even on very high end machines, or you want to do things where like throughout an animation, you are like dynamically reloading data, large data sets, maybe streaming in gigabytes of data and kind of flushing those through as you render your frames. These are all kinds of things that, that you can use Hubble GL to do. Um, and I wanted to just kind of go over, uh, the library itself and how to use it, but then also want to talk about the concepts and the narrative concepts. Like, how do you actually go about designing and thinking about uh, thinking about video clips and thinking about animations and maps, um, which is which is not all technical. It's actually much more much more design and much more about aesthetics and the way that the motion feels and making a connection with your audience. So I'd like to go through some examples of of work I've done in the past and and kind of dissect that a little bit with you. Um, and so, but to start, I, I kind of want to talk a little bit about why we have to do offline rendering. Um, DeckGL has like a ton of really beautiful layers and features. It has lighting and shade, sh shadow effects and all these kinds of things. Um, it's, it's really, really actually great for presentation. Um, and you can combine it with base maps too, and you can bring all these things together and make some really, really compelling presentations. Um, the DeckGL as a library, though, is designed primarily to be used interactively, right? You're, you're, you build applications with it, and, and for that matter, most things on the web are designed for real-time interactive use cases. Um, even, even new web standards for recording video inside the browser, like the media recorder, that is primarily built for a real-time streaming use case where what you basically want to do is you don't care if you lose a frame or two here or there, you know, if you have like a little jittery or buffering, it doesn't really mind. Uh, like it's designed for those cases where it doesn't really matter. Um, but for these complex scenes and the things that I'm talking about, higher quality, uh, you know, not dropping frames, very high resolution, no compression, getting all these things out of the browser is key. Um, and so uh, often, uh, what that means is we take this approach called offline rendering where you have this loop um, where you basically let DeckGL and all these things run as is, like as an interactive, as a 60 frame per second thing. You kind of just let it do its thing. But you bring, you bring uh, Deck through this render loop where you might interpolate properties of, of the Deck layers and then maybe load in data dynamically as the view state changes, maybe new tiles and things like that. You'll let deck draw, and then deck has all these uh, callbacks, which in base maps suit as well, that will tell you, oh, all the data is loaded now. Oh, all of the rendering is done. We are ready for you to like capture a frame and 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 kind of do it again. And so uh, this loop uh, is how uh, Hubble at a high level operates. You can specify an animation, and it will bring that animation through time. It'll interpret the props. It'll do the draw calls. Once the draw calls are done, it'll then capture the frames and repeat until the animation's done. 
and it spits out a sequence of PNGs, a GIF, or a video file that's been encoded directly inside the web browser. There's no server side to any of this. It's, it's actually encoding video and images and then giving you those downloadable blobs that you can then bring into video editors and other kinds of uh, you know, presentation software like PowerPoint or Keynote. Um, so I have a few examples that I can show. Um, this, is the, this is the website too. Uh, the first example here is kind of uh, this uh, rendering of airspace data throughout Los Angeles. Um, I have a few kind of higher res versions of this that we can look at. This uh, is a basically, oh, not coming up so great here, but it's a dark deck, like a dark base map layer, I think at Mapbox, you have uh, a month's worth of airspace data throughout Los Angeles being rendered on there and all the different airports around the region. And what it's doing is it's, it's running through that time series and um, running through the camera animation. Uh, and what it uh, is doing is it's rendering all this directly in the browser. And this is like a direct output of Hubble GL. So you're able to get these 60 frames per second, 4K videos out of your web browser um, which, you know, is kind of something that you typically would leave to like Blender or uh, Cinema 4D, these like traditional 3D modeling rendering softwares. You can now adapt your DeckGL uh, projects to kind of replace, in many cases, these more complicated, very specialized um, tools that are desktop tools. Like this is just a website. You can make this into a tooling and, and give it to someone and they can export their maps and animations. Um, so a few examples just run through. Um, and uh, I think uh, something that I wanted to, I, one of the first things I want to point out in all these examples is um, camera motion. So in most of these examples, the, the camera itself is, is hardly moving. You'll notice like you could interpolate zoom, bearing, pitch. You could do all that. But uh, if you, the more you do that, the more complicated and, and hard it's going to be for your audience to understand what they're looking at. You'd really like the audience to instead connect with what they're looking at. And so here we're combining a bunch of different techniques where we are kind of easing the motion in by accelerating into it, just in this case, moving uh, vertically. And um, the, the data behind it is just kind of moving along so you can get a sense of what's going on. Um, some other examples uh, here. So um, for my day job, I work at a company that builds this aircraft. It's an electric aircraft um, that takes off vertically. It has no emissions. Uh, it's a really neat aircraft. About a year ago, or yeah, about a year ago, we a little over a year ago, we flew over 150 miles with this aircraft and made some really interesting map animations with it. So here's one of them. Um, here we have a combination of a DeckGL uh, trip layer. Uh, there's a there's a little point cloud right there, and then you know you're using Mapbox as a base here, and it's just kind of zooming around and giving you a sense of like the distance that we flew. Um, and then on this uh, next animation. We're looking at what a trip might look like between two cities. What I want to point out on this animation, though, is a technique in the motion um, called uh, kind of like identifying your hero and, and timing your motion with your hero. So uh, in this uh, motion, basically what I'm trying to show in this animation is that you can fly somewhere faster than you can drive there. So that blue arc is representing a flight between San Francisco and Lake Tahoe. That's about 150 miles, about the distance we flew. So we're like, want to show like, hey, like we flew in a circle, but how long is that if you kind of extend that out? So we show that um, as a blue dashed line. And this is using, again, like the DeckGL trip layer with a little extension that allows you to use the, the path extension on it to do that dashed line effect. Um, and then a little scatter plot for the, for the dot. Um, if you notice on the camera motion, it's a little subtle, uh, but the camera basically pulls out and stops the moment that the plane lands in Tahoe. And then we wait for the rest of the animation for the car to kind of catch up. It's a very subtle technique, but it, I use this throughout these different animations. And when you're thinking about a story that you want to tell to someone, you want to be thinking about 
what are you drawing the most attention to? There's probably only one thing per clip that a person is gonna walk away with. And so uh, uh, keeping that in mind as you're designing your motion is, is very important to make that connection. Um, so those are some examples. Uh, we can get back into how Hubble GL works a little bit and then dive into some of the more, uh, the, some of the workshop where we can build some animations together. Um, so within the library, it has a few core concepts. Um, there's basically a visualization target. This can be deck GL, it can, it can also be Kepler GL. It can be any HTML canvas, um, really. And uh, you just have to be able to to do that high level loop I was talking about where there's some kind of prop you're gonna interpolate over and bring it through that you can then capture and encode frames of. So uh, you need some visualization target. Um, everybody in the room that can build a deck GL app can do that, uh, or even a Kepler GL app, uh, like map you can, you can do in there too. Then you need to be able to do keyframe animations. So I'll get into this a little bit more in detail in a sec, but um, keyframe animations are basically, the idea is you, you define, um, you define uh, like the start and end points for actions in your animations. And so this concept of keyframe animation and interpolation is used throughout the web. You, you have it in CSS. There's, uh, it's also used throughout video editing. I, Zhao Ji mentioned earlier that we're trying to build some of this into deck itself. Um, but uh, right now there's an implementation of keyframes in LumaGL. And so we can use that to do keyframe animation within the, this GL ecosystem. Um, and then uh, for animations, you also tip, I mentioned earlier, kind of the control over the speed of your motion, and that is called easing. It's this, this ability to kind of like start your motion slowly, speed it up, and then slow it down again, or have total control over that if you want to kind of have a bouncing one. There's springs and different kinds of easings. Um, they all feel differently, so you can employ those. And then finally, uh, a variety of different rendering modes. So you need a way of previewing what you're trying to design without it taking a long time to render. And then you also need a bunch of different encoders that work natively in the browser that do not require expensive servers or a bunch of infrastructure to set up in order to just get a GIF out of this, out of the system. Um, and then something that I call adapters, which is more or less um, like the glue. Adapters are something that kind of connects, if you're using React, it connects React with like Mapbox and DeckGL, all these different things with their own life cycles <laughs> that you're interpolating those props through and you need the signals to say, when, are my, when am I ready to capture that frame? You, the adapter class in, in Hubble is, is what you use to kind of link all those things together into the video recorder. Um, Hubble also ships with the variety of encoders that I mentioned, there's PNG, GIF, those can kind of get packaged up into zip files using LoaderGL's like zip module. Um, there's WebM, which is an open source uh, video format that, that uh, is supported in Chrome and different browsers. Um, and then there's, there's GIF as well. Um, and I hope soon to be able to do something like APNG or some of these other uh, animated uh, image formats that are coming out because GIF is, is a very lossy format. And, but it works everywhere, so definitely support that. Um, and then uh, there's uh, something called an animation. There's a number of animation classes. There's a deck animation class and a Kepler animation class. And what these classes are is they facilitate the ability to define like deck layers in the deck case, and then view state uh, animations and also the keyframes for those deck layers. And then for the Kepler case, you can. There's all the different kinds of Kepler layers, so you can specify. Uh, animations for Kepler filters. So if you want to be able to do any kind of filter, a time filter, number filter, you can animate those. You can animate the trip layer in Kepler. You can animate opacity and all the different attributes within a Kepler map, um, making basically a higher level version of the deck map uh, that, you can, that you can integrate into Kepler GL applications. Um, and then there's a couple kinds of keyframe classes that go with those animation classes but it's, it's all pretty straightforward. And then there's a variety of different easings and e easings are really, you can get easing functions from everywhere. You may have heard of smooth step, you may have heard of linear, which is like no easing, but basically it's a function that takes time as an input and returns time as an output between like zero and one. Um, you, it, it sounds a little limited, but there's actually a lot you can do with it. So I, I'm, I'm gonna show you a, an easing tool uh, very soon that I, that I use a lot. Um, this is what a keyframe, look like a keyframe definition looks like. Here you basically are saying, 
Uh, I'm going to animate a couple features in my layer, like opacity and radius, maybe on a scatter plot. Then what you go and do in the next bit is you more or less say those stopping and endpoints. So we're going to say we're going to start our opacity at zero and radius at two, uh, 200. This will be um, basically the value that radius and opacity will be at at 500 milliseconds into your animation. The next one is what it'll be at 2,000 milliseconds into your animation. So you have opacity and radius are changing. It will interpolate through that. How many interpolations it'll do is defined elsewhere. You get to define a frame rate, which is basically a division of frames per second. Um, and, uh, and then you can also specify easings. You can do different easings between individual keyframes or have the same easing across all keyframes. But down here, I basically have an example where you can see throughout the animation, let's say that our current frame is over here at this moment in time, uh, about one second into the animation, the value gets interpolated from 0 0.0 to 0 0.5 on its way to one. And then same goes for the, uh, the radius decreasing in size is, you know, at 116. So it's just showing you that that is what is occurring during that interpolation loop. These values are changing. The computer handles the interpolation for you. You just kind of define those starting and ending points of your actions. It's a, it's a pretty, I mean, it's pretty much the standard and most common way to animate things in different tools. And so that's what we do. Um, Want to go a little bit into the render loop in detail to show you what that looks like. Um, more or less what happens when you, you know, say, go capture this. Um, the first frame will be set. The keyframes will be interpolated, which means that the deck view state will change. Deck layers will update to new prop values. If you're using Mapbox, the view state there will change too. It'll all synchronize. That state updates. New tiles get loaded in. Those get updated. WebGL finally renders and says, hey, I'm done rendering. When that occurs, Hubble picks that up, says, OK, I'm going to add those pixels to your encoder and kind of repeat until we hit that last frame. At that point, the capturing stops. In some cases, there's post-processing steps. Like in the case of GIFs, you will actually look back at all the frames you just captured. A GIF can only have like 256 colors in it. And so you actually want to look back at all of the images you just captured, find the best colors to use, and define a palette based off of that. And uh, that post-processing step takes extra time. It's an asynchronous process. And then that's like how you get your output video. In many other encoding formats, they don't have a post-processing output. You just kind of capture it and you get it. So there's an option to define those in the cases you need them. Um, as far as like, uh, we can basically jump straight into the workshop um, next and then it will lead into the easing. So if you want, you can pull this up on your laptop and follow along. Um, I'll leave it up for a second. Uh, and uh, also if you have any questions along the way, I'm happy to answer them. I want to jump over to the workshop, but I want to leave this up long enough for people to type it out too if you need it. Um, all right. So for I broke the workshop up into two parts um, because I, I wanted to kind of go over the the most basic concepts first, and then introduce complexity in the second part. So for the first part, we're kind of just going to do a hello world example. Um, for this uh, hello world example to start, this is what the animation looks like. And it renders a GIF when you hit render. So to begin with, I'm going to kind of expand this JavaScript so we can spend some time focusing in on this part. I've broken this up into different sections. We'll kind of go top down through it. At the very beginning, you'll set some high level animation rendering settings. These are things like the uh, actual duration of your animation. So here we're saying that our animation at a high level is going to be a three second long animation. Um, I'll make this a little bigger so it's easier to see. Three second long animation and 30 frame per second frame rate. The resolution that we're going to render at will be uh, 1080p, so 1920 by 1080. Um, we're going to be using a GIF encoder right now. And then set up. you can set up different configurations for your different formats, so on WebM or GIF. On GIF, I actually typically scale this down. GIF is, has no compression. And so the easiest way to keep your GIFs below like 10 megabytes or something reasonable is to actually just scale them down. 
Um, so that's very commonly done. Uh, another way to do it is to reduce your frame rate. It's maybe like 10 or 15 frames per second. Um, then after that, we're going to get into our animation settings. So you know, this doesn't look like a geospatial example, but I decided to actually do it in geospatial. So we've got a lot of, you've got the basic view state to start with, um, which is defining kind of uh, the space that we're in. And then here we have the first use of a, a Hubble class. We have the deck animation that I mentioned earlier. Um, how the deck animation works is it expects you to basically define a function called get layers, which returns deck layers. This function will be called throughout that interpolation loop. And it's how deck doesn't really need to know or be aware of the interpolations happening to it. But this loop will happen. And as it occurs, uh, the interpolated values will be replaced. Um, and it's not magic. The way that they're replaced is basically the, the animation object that's returned by get layers and is called. You, you can pass it through this apply layer keyframes object which will go through uh, the deck layers and set the uh, update triggers and the props that match what you've defined down in layer keyframes. So if you've defined in your first keyframe that you're gonna be animating opacity and radius scale, those will be the update triggers and the values that are interpolated throughout the animation. The other props will not be touched. So, uh, that, that's just basically how this works. And, it, and it's linked up by the, the deck layer ID. So you can define this object however you want. Um, and in here, just to start with, we have this basic uh, keyframe. You know, see here it's the circle is scaling up and fading in over one second. And the text is kind of offsetting down. Um, interpolation on arrays works. So it, you don't have to really think about that. It's just going to interpolate that negative 64 to a zero and leave the other zero alone over one second. This is happening um, and, uh, and, then, and then being encoded to a GIF. The rest of this is kind of uh, stuff you're, I mean, this, this is just like a little bit of Hubble GL uh, boilerplate. This is the adapter that I mentioned. This is where you say, okay, we're gonna, use, we're gonna, we're gonna push this animation in to the deck adapter and use this object to then, um, synchronize the deck instance. And if you were using a base map or React, you might use some different functions on here as well, but I kept this one simple. Down here, you define your standard deck instance. Um, really, the only notable thing is to define a clear color on your parameters. Most deck instances have a transparent background, but most video formats don't support transparency. So you're going to need to define a background color, which could be a base map, or if you're not using those, you're going to want to define a clear color. Um, from here, we set up the rendering loop. Uh, that rendering loop basically consists of passing in your deck instance to Hubble. Then you define a, a little draw loop here. Here we're going to basically on every ne on next every time there's a new frame, we're going to call set props, which will kind of get the new interpolated props and pass those into deck. And this is where like the layers and view state interpolations and all that actually get applied. And then the rest of this is related to rendering. So in here, like this video that embedder that we're looking at for a GIF, you get a blob out of Hubble GL, and then I'm loading that into an image, uh, an image uh, tag. For video, we have a video tag, and then we have the uh, the actual render call. So this is this is the function that you'll call when you click the render button, and every time you click that render button, you can define a new kind of uh, time code or a new uh, format configuration. So if you want to be able to change the settings of your rendering, you get to do, you have a chance to do that um, every time you render. So this is where you would say, I'm going to render like a quick preview and maybe do half a uh, quarter of the resolution and use like the preview encoder instead of the GIF encoder. Um, and I'll, I'll show that in just a sec, but this is, this is kind of how that's working. There's also a bunch of lifecycle callbacks at this point, which is to say, what do you do when the rendering is complete? And what do you do when the post-processing step is complete and you're ready to now save that blob? Um, in this case, when that post-processing is done, we're going to pass that blob into embed video, and that's, that's how we actually get it to render on the screen. Um, down here at the bottom, we are setting up the animation lifecycle. So, 
up above, we did a, a deck animation. The way that that deck animation's props are applied to deck itself is through callbacks. So you have an on layer update callback in this case. Uh, in Kepler, you'll have like an on filter update callback or an on view state uh, update callback. Pass those in, um, and then the bottom is just basic UI stuff. So really, that is the overall uh, kind of setup for a Hubble GL animation. Let's make it a little more interesting. So right now, uh, this this uh, motion is linear, linearly eased. It's it's like kind of starting right away and and doesn't really slow down. And so I want to show one of my favorite tools for learning how to use easing and understanding what the concept of easing is. Um, it's called Epic Easing. It's a website uh, where you can basically go in and get a bunch of different easing curves, get values out of it very quickly, and then bring those in to your cubic bezier easing function. Um, this is what we are currently using for easing. It's linear, you know, basically the animation is constant speed. But to make it look a little nicer, we can use something like an epic ease where you can say compared to linear, it's gonna really kind of shoot into the motion. And so to do that, we can copy this value here um, and uh, bring it in to the workshop and define uh, easing down here. So at this point, you can define uh, easings and we'll use the, we, I use pop motion for the easing library usually. And I think I copied this earlier. Yeah, pop motion cubic vizier. And when that is done and renders, it will now kind of, the, the circle is now going to kind of come on. It's a kind of subtle effect, but when you're doing this with a lot of things and with your camera, it, it really does make a difference. Um, so you can do easings there. And uh, one last thing I want to show on this workshop, it, this workshop uh, part one, is the different encoders. So here you can see that we have this GIF encoder here. I want to show the WebM encoder. So if you choose the WebM encoder instead and render that out, it will result in uh, a video being embedded here, which you know is like a full-on video that you can then take and download, and then now bring into a movie editor. This was, uh, you know, a one-line change to be able to change that encoder. And then the last thing I want to show is the preview encoder, which is basically uh, something you can use when you don't want to actually render out a video artifact, but you just want to look at what it should look like very quickly. So preview encoder, pretty straightforward, you know, just renders it out. The last thing I want to show uh, down here on the controls is this time scrubber. So if you want, you can kind of scroll through your animation and seek through the different elements of it. So that's pretty useful if you don't want to render the whole thing out and just see a, see a moment in time and see how the timing lines up. So moving on to the second part of the workshop, um, different link. Uh, and while this is up, are there any questions at this point? Yeah. Why obviously we've got to recapture the camera, right? Yeah. So what about super high resolution or images or Yeah, um, there is an upper limit on canvas size. You can go well above 4K video, which is, uh, you know, well above what you're probably going to need. Um, but if you would like to do, let's say, a 50,000 pixel by 50,000 pixel export, you can do that. If you basically subdivide, if you kind of determine the extent of your viewport and subdivide that into, like, let's say, rings, uh, like if you have your center point and then build a ring around that and then a ring around that of subdivided frames, you can extend this ring out almost indefinitely and develop a huge image that you can then stitch together. Um, and so you can define basically those individual frames as keyframes in this and then use the PNG exporter to then export those individual frames as images. And uh, that's, that's, uh, that's my favorite way of doing something like that. 
Um, I have it written down somewhere what the maximum number of pixels is for a WebGL to Canvas context. It's it's big, but it's not like infinitely large. And so for 50,000 or even 20,000 by 20,000 so pixel size images or map renderings, you're, you're gonna need to do that subdivision. But you can use um, like the web, web uh, Mercator class in DeckGL to do like a fit bounds equation and kind of do some of that math. Like DeckGL does have classes that help with that math. MathGL has that too. So you're not completely on your own when you're having to do that. Um, Happy to talk more about it afterwards and show you, yeah. All right, part two. So um, for this example, uh, I want, I in the background, you can kind of see this like Pan Am routes. Uh, it's an old, uh, it's an old, like from the sixties and seventies, like kind of what Pan Am's airlines looked like. So I wanted to kind of recreate that style and bring that in and um, make movies that look uh, sort of like this. Uh, where you can see like a ton of air traffic data flying throughout the United States in that old style and see it all kind of moving around and nice smooth 60 frames per second motion, you know, the good stuff. Um, and uh, look around the, we could basically could do like a little world tour and look around and see all the different planes that fly around every day. Um, so that's what this uh, next part uh, can do. That's what this one can do. So um, I'll show you just to start like a basic preview of what we're starting with. We're starting with the camera over Europe with this trip layer in there. And it's kind of just basically like panning in and zooming in a little bit. Um, the, the project is more or less structured exactly the same as the last uh, project. The only difference you'll find is in that deck animation section. So. Here, I'm just defining different layers. I'm not using a base map here, by the way. I'm using like the natural earth GeoJSON to get that uh, continent, uh, the continents there. And then they also have a, a list of airports. And then I'm using from Kepler GL, uh, the world flights example of like a sampling of airspace, tra airspace uh, data that they have. So I load all that in, uh, bring the countries into GeoJSON layer, get an airports in. Those are static, they're just kind of there. And then um, in the background, you can kind of maybe tell uh, that uh, we are kind of ghosting the path, uh, the, like ghosting the full path of, of the airplanes to give you an effect that there's like something really back there. That's done with the GeoJSON layer. And then in front of that, we have a TRIPS layer. And the TRIPS layer is just your standard TRIPS layer uh, for, for um, this kind of flight data. So once you have those layers all defined, um, in this animation too, unlike the other one, we are doing view state motion as well as layer uh, animation. And so um, here, just to start, I've got a few different camera positions defined. And then I've built in a little widget here where you can take uh, the camera and interact with the page and actually update the, update the keyframes here between these and then it will you know, dynamically update your animation. And so this is more like an animation builder now than just a coding tool. Um, but we have some static ones to start with. Uh, scrolling down, we have our animation. So the animation on this is, is pretty straightforward. Like we've got um, two keyframes for the camera uh, that goes over five seconds. So we've got our timings for five seconds. Our keyframes here are, um, you know, go from point one to point two. And then we have an ease in and ease out, uh, easing on this, which is what's kind of like slowing us in and getting us out. Um, and then finally, the layer keyframes. The only thing we're animating on this one is the trips layer. It's again five seconds. And what we animate on this is the current time property. So if you animate the current time property, um, that is basically going to scrub the layer through its data timestamps. And that was what gives you the motion. It's a, it's a, it's a GPU. Uh, layer is a GPU animation. So um, we're not doing anything expensive on the CPU in this one. Um, that's, that's it. I mean, the rest of this is actually the same as the old, uh, as the other example. So from here, what we can do is um, I want to introduce uh, the last concept, which is related to view state or camera um, animation. Normally with 
camera animation or with most of these, you just do a standard easing. You just want to take a value from like, let's say opacity or scale. You just want to scale from one value to another. But when you are moving the camera around in your animations around the world, uh, these, these values like zoom and latitude and longitude, they have like nonlinear relationships. So as you animate them, you can end up with pretty like jarring results if you're not using interpolators that are designed for this purpose. Um, you may have probably, you probably have actually used these too. It's called a fly to interpolator as, as opposed to like a linear interpolator. So the camera keyframe has support for that interpolator option. Um, and so if you use interpolators, um, you can go and see in the examples or documentation actually on the Hubble GL website, go into keyframes and the camera keyframes. And down here, you can see we have interpolators, we have the fly to and the linear one. So, you know, it, uh, before I use it, I'll, I'll show you kind of how not to do camera animation. Um, what goes wrong basically, if you don't use, if you don't use linear interpolation. Um, to set that up, I'm going to just basically start very zoomed out on the US. And my goal is to zoom in to like Los Angeles, let's say. If we do something like that, um, if we don't use a fly to interpolator, what will happen is we'll zoom into the ground very quickly and then pan over a long distance. And uh, it, it, it really shouldn't shouldn't look right, you know. Um, oh, JS Fiddle likes to refresh sometimes. I'm not really sure why. Okay, update that keyframe and then we'll zoom way in down by LAX, one of the busiest airports in the US. And we're gonna see what's going on there. So um, right now we're not using uh, the fly to interpolator, I'm pretty sure. And so what should happen is we're gonna zoom straight into like Colorado and then go over Nevada. And you know, you've kind of lost your reference at this point. You have no idea what we're really looking like. And then you finally get into Los Angeles. It'd be much nicer to kind of have the curve, keep the Pacific ocean in view the whole time, right? And so that is what the fly to interpolator will typically do for you. It'll kind of change that curve so that, uh, so that it, it keeps the, the motion smoother as you go in. So um, it's very quick to do, fly to, save that, set up the uh, keyframe again. And now it should uh, basically keep the Pacific Ocean in the view the whole time. So what this is doing is it's basically just changing the math on the zoom value. Um, and this is combining then with the ease in and ease out easing as well. And so the motion stays smooth, but we're modifying the path of the camera as it zooms in basically to keep more to keep a better context for the people watching. Uh, that is more or less all I had to show, you know, from this, it also supports, you, you, you know, you can go in and if you wanna take, uh, take a peek at this and ask questions, more than happy to, to answer throughout, you know, find me on, on Slack, um, push it to its limits. I'd love to see 60 frame per second, 4K video coming out of all your browsers. I think that'd be really sweet. Uh, and, uh, you know, no more quick time screen capture with the mouse in there, you know, it's kind of replacing all that. Um, thank you for your time. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, um, the biggest, Oh yeah, uh, he's, uh, Felix asked if there are any uh, performance bottlenecks and kind of gotchas in the different DECGL layers and you know, all, uh, in the ecosystem. The, the biggest performance hit, and you probably saw it actually, uh, that it's definitely not operating at 60 frames per second, 
there, there are large performance hits in rendering and almost all of it is in the encoders because these encoders are not hardware accelerated at all. Like Paul was here talking yesterday about um, the like MP4 hardware accelerated CUDA encoders. There's none of that. In fact, MP4 is like not even supported because it's not an open source encoder and browsers don't ship a non real time MP4 encoder. So almost all of the time spent is actually on that encoding step. Interpolating is almost instant. Um, layer performance is the same in this context as it is in the rest of the deck context. Uh, the only time I guess uh, you can run into like really big performance hits um, are in instances I actually didn't cover, uh, but I do have a, a, a video that can show what this looks like. Basically when you have like large amounts of data that are loading, you're gonna be waiting that bandwidth time for it to download and parse and load onto the screen. Um, and then when you bump the resolution way up, a lot of computers are gonna have a hard time with that. And you'll actually typically run into you run out of memory. Like you run out of browser memory if you buffer too much into, into your um, encoder. Uh, so it's kind of hard to export high resolution videos that are like a minute long, for example. Uh, Chrome typically just will say, I ran out of memory and kind of crash your page. So for those instances, you can do kind of chunked renderings where you can export, export your rendering and basically into like chunks of PNGs and then stitch your video back together again. Um, that's my current recommended technique. I think I'm also looking into like using the file system access API to be able to directly just put blobs of stuff on your computer as it renders. So you're not actually wasting any memory. You're basically doing like a memory leak. You kind of get rid of that whole paradigm by just dumping PNGs right onto disk. Um, so yeah, that's the current performance stuff. Uh, but this quick video just shows like, um, rendering like Mount St. Helens and doing the train stuff to talk about performance. This is before Hubble GL was waiting for tiles to load before actually capturing the screen. You can see the tiles loading in. And so um, a lot of work was done to understand how all the base maps kind of that it interacts with like load data and tiles and how to wait for that, wait for those signals. Um, so now this won't happen anymore. If you go into Hubble GL's examples and try this one out, it's the landmark tour what you'll see is that as it's rendering, it's skipping. It looks like it's skipping. It looks like it's not working. But what it's actually doing here is it is going to like stop and wait for the data to load before continuing on in the interpolation, which to my knowledge is kind of a unique thing. Like most uh, like Blender and all these other things, they don't have a concept of like async data loading and waiting for all these things. Um, you have to pre-fetch all map tiles onto your disk if you want to do something like this in Blender. But because this is just a web environment where async is king and we know and DeckGL has like native support for all this, you can blend kind of the best of both worlds. You can start to blend animation world with like data world. And uh, I mean, that's that's why I keep coming back and using this tool and, and, and develop it so much is because as I see these layers get richer and richer and data sources richer and richer, you're going to be able to make some really cool animations um, for, for a very long time. Any other questions? All right. Oh, yeah. So you have to go for something like, for example, watermarks, metadata, based on screen, for example, Yeah, um, so what you could do is you can add an orthographic view in DeckGL on top of this. Uh, we actually worked on a bug fix for that because it didn't work out of the box originally, but you can now basically do like multiple deck views in all this and capture those. So if you do a text layer on an orthographic view on the bottom left, you can kind of you know, put like a legend there or like widgets. Um, I've overlaid like compasses on it to kind of give people an idea of like where they're looking at. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of, uh, and, and those will act, since they're on the canvas itself, it will be captured to the video and make it to the, to the blob. Um, if you put HTML and that kind of stuff over this, it's, it's not going to capture that. It's just kind of not in the canvas, right? So you're going to need some way of converting your HTML to something that actually gets embedded on a canvas before we can capture. Um, yeah, so that, that's how you can do watermarks today, orthographic view. Thank you. Thank you.